Okay, welcome back to QGIS Road to Nirvana, episode 29. Um, an overview of the OSGS, the Open Source Geospatial Stack. And I'm joined with our uh, trusty gang of Merry GIS um, practitioners from Cartosa. Um, I'll say your name and just say hi quickly afterwards. So we've got Charlie. Hello. <laughs> I'm trying to find the list of names. We've got Amy. We've got Lesejo. Hello. And we've got Vicky. Hello. And we've got Tiasha. Hi. With us in the room. So, um, welcome everybody. And um, today's session, we're going to be doing an overview of the um, open source geospatial stack. So, um, uh, it's going to be kind of a high level view of the stack, and we'll start covering. Um, you know all the basics of what it is and then I'm going to be doing some live demos and uh, hopefully everything works perfectly first time that's uh, that's the goal so first of all first question is what is the OSGS stack um, uh, basically um, there are a bunch of fantastic open source software projects out there that relate to geospatial technology and also maybe on the periphery of te geospatial technology things that help you to move data around your organization uh, things that help you to massage data and transform it you know from one state to another uh, things that just help you you know publish information uh, build websites um, uh, and all these kind of things so they've so got this whole um, ecosystem of fantastic tools out there but um, one of the, I guess, shortcomings of open source is often that these things are in a scattered, um, like, um, scattered around the internet. And it's up to you to go and find all the things that you want to use and integrate them together and to make a cohesive um, project or product. And I guess that's where the proprietary vendors maybe often um, have the edge on the open source projects. So if you go to somebody like Esri or... Um, um, Autodesk, what have you? They've they've built their whole their whole stack. They've taken often uh, also open source components. So, for example, in Esri, you'll find that there is the GDAL um, Google project is embedded in their um, stack as well. But they try to present everything in a kind of cohesive, ready to run um, system. And so that's kind of what I've been trying to do with the open source geospatial stack or OSGS, uh, is to like bring all these things together. Uh, like picking the best of breed often of things if there are multiple s software projects that do the same thing and uh, make them kind of easy to deploy and all set up to work together quite well. Um, so the OSGS has a home page on GitHub and um, uh, we, we've been trying to document it well and uh, on, the, on the home page you can sort of see I need to update this diagram at some point, but you can see um, like an overview like this of the kind of things that you can be doing where you've got basically in the middle of your infrastructure, you're going to have a database, Postgres database, and um, uh, and then all the different mechanisms for moving data into the database and out of the database. So for example, working the field with input or queue field and synchronizing your data over uh, using some syncing protocols to the database or working with your data on QGIS desktop and pushing and pulling data in and out of the database working with uh, file-based databases like geo packages and having the translation between file-based and uh, like an enterprise database like Postgres all of these are the sort of typical problems you'd want to solve when building a stack and then on the on the website is you know publishing your projects to the internet as a web mapping project, uh, doing it efficiently using like proxying protocols, build, you know, publishing things securely using uh, uh, you know SSL and um, in, in, in an encrypted way so that people can't eavesdrop on your traffic and so on, and then down to the client of having you know web applications which can display the projects that you've been building in a web browser as using web mapping technologies like leaflet or open layers and so on. So that's kind of the overview of what we are seeking to achieve in the stack and there are many other components that I've since added since I drew this original diagram for example doing things like um, processing uh, tool chains and BI business intelligence and 
so you can build dashboards and so on. So I'll try to cover just a little bit of, you know, of some of those different things. If you look on the um, on the documentation page, you'll actually see this list of services here, and this gives you an outline of the different things that are that the stack is composed of. And I think we might also be missing one or two things out of here. Um, but it gives you a kind of a good sense. So we've got Nginx, which is a web um, a web serving uh, what's it <laughs> yeah, a web serving engine or what have you. So you can serve web pages from it efficiently. It's quite lightweight and easy to configure. So it's a nice baseline platform for you know putting something on the web. And then we've got this file browser project, um, which is allowing you to push and pu pull data between the website and your local computer. Uh, we've got this thing called Hugo and Hugo Watcher, which allows you to generate the actual like landing page environment. Um, we've got Postgres and PostGIS, which is the database backend. QGIS Server, which is the QGIS uh, centric uh, map serving backend. GeoServer, which is more of a um, OGC standards compliant um, like alternative uh, way of serving up maps from, from the internet. Um, we've got this Docker OSM mirror project, which is providing a way to uh, uh, take a clipped area from anywhere on Earth and have it mirror whatever is an open street map as raw data in a geospatial database so that you can actually use it for your own uh, projects or make your own maps or whatever you want to do with it, do your own analysis on it. We've got Node Red, which is um, uh, it's um, no-code, low-code programming environment where you basically program by building a graph and um, you add nodes to the graph. Each node does a different processing step. It's kind of similar conceptually to the QGIS processing framework, but it's meant for generic data processing and, uh, and data manipulation. Um, then we've got Jupyter Notebook, which is... Um, a uh, Python online environment for writing shareable um, Python applications. Um, or, and I think flows. it supports other languages as well. It's oh, Python. it does it? Oh, okay. Yeah. What other languages does it support just out of interest? Uh, R probably. <laughs> uh, there's actually a bunch, a bunch of them, but I think okay. it runs R Python under the hood. Um, okay. So. That's interesting to know. Um, we've got Postgres which is um, an add-on to Postgres. And what that pr does is provides a RESTful API. So RESTful API is, um, uh, when, I, when I started with um, like web services um, in the old days, like back in the, the mid-2000, uh, 2002, 2003, um, everything was done with XML and um, uh, soap. <laughs> soap, yeah. A simple object access protocol, I think it was something like that. And it was like the the protocols for communicating machine to machine were very cumbersome and um, uh, like like had a lot not of... Not human re readable. <laughs> yeah, not human readable and a lot of rigor involved in actually building an application where two machines talk to each other. And Postgres kind of, uh, sorry, not Postgres, REST kind of um, uh, flipped that around and, and especially with the introduction of JSON, this, the JavaScript Simple Object Notation, I think it stands for, um, basically provided this very simple way to represent data and to ask a machine uh, for some information just by basically giving a URL, um, which w and the URLs were like intended to be easily understandable. So if you'd have a URL, for example, like uh, cartoza.github.io slash... Um, uh, projects slash list, then you get a list of the projects. So you could kind of intuit from the API um, endpoints what you're going to get easily, and they were um, all designed to just run easily from a browser, you know, from within a browser technology. So um, Postgres basically adds that RESTful API on top of your PostGIS database so that you can actually um, connect to the data that's contained in your database via a, a, a web service and use program, you know, machine to machine communication to access data out of your database without needing to access it using a database like um, access protocol. Um, Swagger is, a, is an explorer environment for um, a REST API. So it basically gives you a web user interface um, 
that lets you... I think it's called Open API now. It's oh, Open API, I think, yeah. Yeah, and it gives you like a nice um, way to see what the, the REST service can do and to send requests to it and so on. Metabase is a BI um, platform, it's open source as well. Oh, everything here is open source, um, and it basically allows you to build dashboards to connect to your database and ask questions of your data and represent the answers either as tables of information or as um, charts or dials or um, progress bars or these kind of things, maps, what have you. So um, that's all integrated in the stack as well. SCP is probably going to be, a, maybe I'll eventually phase it out, but it's just a, a, a way to move data to the server using secure, it stands for secure copy protocol. Um, and so it will let you um, upload files or download files from your server securely and um, probably useful for if you're trying to move large data sets around that maybe this file browser um, doesn't um, manage quite as well. Um, Lizmap, if, if it's got a WIP in front, you can see um, here, that means that uh, it's not production ready. And Lizmap is a super nice um, web, uh, web mapping project environment where you can have multiple we uh, web mapping projects and you've even got tools where you can do some editing and uh, visualization, querying, filtering, whatever, you, of your database and it uses QGIS server on the back end. So it's on the roadmap to include that in the stack, although it's not um, available yet. Um, and then there's also Merge and Server. So Merge and Server is um, the server side component of this field uh, collection tools that have been written by Lutra Consulting. and um, it basically gives you a very nice web user interface where you can view your projects that you've created on mobile. So I know, Fiasha, you've been playing around a bit with the mobile data collection. We can actually run our own backend um, for that mobile data collection on, on the stack. Um, the Merge and Client and Merge and DB Sync are two different ways to actually um, migrate your data from uh, your mobile database ultimately into your Postgres database. So. Um, uh, or onto the file system. So basically, um, if you think about like having developed a mobile data collection project with input and merging, and you've got it set up on your computer, you synchronize it to your phone, the third step would be synchronizing it to a server somewhere so that um, you can publish the data like in a web map or um, uh, in a form or uh, produce some reports with your BI tools and so on. So unless Charlie and Vicky think I've left something out of the list there, that's kind of the, the broad overview. And then what I'm going to do now is going to try and demo a bunch of these different things to you very briefly. Like I'll try to like time slot myself to like five or so minutes per thing. Did I leave anything I don't out? Know, maybe it's, uh, it's worthwhile if I just go over as like a higher level <laughs> yeah. interview, overview than, than what you've stated there. And basically, you know, the, the, the problem that this tries to solve is that, you know, with any geospatial infrastructure or spatial data infrastructure that you implement, normally there's like three primary components. It's going to be like your data storage, um, which handles access to your data and so on. Uh, and then your, um, your, your server or services, which, you know, take that data and then represent it as services that you can consume or publish with you know your client endpoints which might be like a web map service it might be a desktop application like QGIS or of uh, just pro or whatever the case is that like um, you, you've basically got the the end user and then you've got the end user consuming that data from a server environment and then uh, you know publishing data to the database so um, those are kind of the three main components is just data storage service uh, serving and then yeah, it would be good to put that sort of like higher level conceptual thing maybe in the introduction, yeah, or something like that, yeah. Yeah, um, so th but the, the thing is that uh, there's a lot of complexity at every level there. So uh, mm. how you manage your data, how you manage the data lifecycle management, do you consume flat files and integrate them into your, uh, so flat files would be like chat files or, or uh, even geo packages or, or geo JSON files or whatever the case is, and then you need to manage that lifecycle, do some processing, get them into the database, uh, then you've got to manage things like coordinate reference systems and all these kind of complex things. Um, then once you've got the data services up and running, you know, you've got to do th complex things like permission management and so on. Then when you get to the like the, the client facing stuff like uh, web maps and, and so on, you've got 
things like you know web services managing caching and, and you know like meta tile buffers or you know whatever level of complexity it is um, and can you you know how do all these things integrate and talk to each other and there's a lot of very clever people developing a lot of very clever tools um, but the open source ecosystem is like a little bit fragmented like to mentioned. so when new people come into the ecosystem that you know there, there's three tools that do um, you know, sometimes they have a lot of overlap in, in the jobs that or the tasks that they perform and so on. So this entire framework is pretty much just like an opinionated, you know, we've gone and like with our knowledge of like all of these tools, gone and selected a couple of them, wired them up to communicate and talk to each other and designing like uh, more efficient workflows. So for example, um, you know, like Tim mentioned the integration of Mergen, you know, you can go and have field mapping applications that are, you know, you, you set up the open source GIS stack, you go and do some field mapping, and then you know all the complexity of synchronizing that uh, that data is uh, like captured in the field, integrating it into um, the enterprise database, and then publishing it as a web map or something like that. You know we handle all of those kind of complex workflows, and then the uh, uh, the inclusion of additional tools like the Node Red platform, which is pretty much like a visual programming language. Really, uh, you, you kind of have these. You can wire up your own workflows within the stack and then you have access to all these different components and, and you can like make custom workflows from it. So that's kind of the really high level, like, you know, without going too much <laughs> into too much detail into each service, you know, what this tries to achieve. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Um, cool, so I'm gonna dive in. If you guys wanna uh, keep chipping in as you as well, Vicky, feel free to do so. Really, it's great to have your, your uh, like um, additional um, ideas and thoughts added. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just first show you what you get. Like if you spin up an instance, what you get is you get a website. And um, the website will look something like this. There is a theming system which is a little bit um, uh, long and involved to explain now. But you can actually, um, there there is a website called Hugo, what's it called? Go Hugo, Go Hugo Themes. Um, uh, where um, maybe that's not the best one, but yeah, they, they've got like galleries of different themes that you can find. So I um, I went through um, uh, this one here. I went through this website, and uh, there was actually a, oh, I don't know hundreds of different themes, and I didn't look at every single one, but I found this really nice one, and I used that one as the as the default. Um, but if you wanted to, you could go and pick another theme. From the gallery here and um, use that as the starting point for your platform. You'd have a little bit of integration work to do, but it's honestly not very difficult for anyone with sort of basic web skills to be able to integrate it into the stack quite easily. Um, oh, that looks very nice. But you know, and so you just find something that catches your eye like that, and then you go and look at the demo. They usually have a demo. Um, where's the demo? Um, not always yeah, a demo. <laughs> there's a demo there. And, oh, okay, the one's broken, but it, whatever. And you go and find, you know, you shop around and you find a theme that you like. But what I tried to do was, like Charles said, have an opinion like, uh, and give a starting page which um, has got a nice theme and it's functional and it's um, like easy to look at. It's got some cool stuff here, like you can switch between dark modes. It's got multilingual support. Um, and this is specifically designed, so this is based on Clarity web components from mm -hmm. VMware. So it's like very enterprise orientated, uh, very accessible and uh, yeah. so like a really good like enterprise starting theme. Yeah. And um, and then on the on, on the concept of the site, like the way that I've structured the navigation is you've got the home, which is basically all basically like blog articles. Um, and then you've got a specific section for maps, which are just ones, which is an article with a map in, embedded in it. And then there's a menu with links to, you'll recognize these names now from that overview we're giving you, uh, to the different services. Most of them will have a password or something that will uh, you'll need to log into, except for the, the Twitters, your own Twitter account, or whatever. But um, these are all uh, published as part of the stack. Um, and you can customize everything in here as well um, using th this. It's all like managed with simple text files where you can go customize things, add new menus or what have you. Um, 
And uh, one of the goals in the future is to have a single sign-on so that if I go to GeoServer or if I go to Jupyter Notebook or whichever one of these I go to that my credentials like get carried through. We don't have that yet, so there is a bit of like credential management needed as you're moving around on the site. Um, if we go and look at um, an article, the articles are, um, uh, you know, it's got all the sort of niceties of a uh, modern website. You can tweet and Facebook and whatever your um, your article. Your, there's a tagging system, so you can categorize and tag things and uh, filter them by those categories and tags. Um, and the writing of the content is done using Markdown, which is, Markdown is a, it's a markup language, so um, uh, it's very simple uh, to use. You basically, um, if I make a new document here, I'll just give you a quick demo. So if you make a new document and save it, like um, um, markdown demo dot, uh, if you give it the MD extension, why can't I write demo today? Come on. <laughs> um, if you give it that MD for Markdown extension, then your text editor will most likely recognize it and it uses a syntax like heading one um, and then heading uh, two and so on. You can put multiple hashes and then you can like bold a sen sentence. Um, or a phrase like that, and you can, what's italics, I think, underscore, underscore, um, and... Uh, uh, it varies between renderers, but you can get, like, a cheat sheet from, like, GitHub flavored yeah. markdown or something online. We should actually uh, you link can also get, like, okay. lists with just, you know, dashes or asterisks, um, you know, rather than trying to write a whole bunch of HTML for unordered lists or something. It's, uh, yeah. it's a minimalist markdown, uh, markup language, essentially. Um, yeah, and just try to like bridge the it, like be an interface between writing something that a computer can parse or or like scan and and digest like what the what the significance of um, each um, component that you've written is, but also make it easy for humans who are not very technical to go and actually produce. So, for example, if you want to make a bulleted list, you just start each line with a dash or a star or whatever. You, and if you want to make a numbered list, you just make a one, two, three in the front, and it will then render them all out. So if I, if I take this document that I've just made and um, open it in a tool like um, VS Code has is, is, uh, got some nice integrations for, for working with Markdown. So if I open it in VS Code, if I can just find the VS Code where it went. Um, uh, let me close that. Public, but anyway, um, um, so if I go to that same file that I just made, um, then I can tell it to put it like in a split view here, like side by side, and you can see as I'm typing things here, like uh, it just gives you like it looks like a Word document, right? And you can say, um, like make a list like this. Um, And if you want to make links... Markdown is very widely used for technical documentation, blog articles, mm. pretty much anything that's web published. Like Writing issues on, on um, GitHub. Yeah, on, on open source projects, uh, issues, project management. Most people actually use it in uh, even in, in things like Telegram or WhatsApp, like uh, you know the, the chat, chat messengers. Um, they, they've started to support Markdown uh, more recently as well. So like you can actually make your... your text bold with markdown syntax, uh, like a limited sub subset of markdown. Then, yeah, so there's definitely like a, a valuable good. skill to have as a, you know, technical <laughs> practitioner in, you know, 2020s, you know, like being able to work in markdown is very useful all over the show. Um, Prerequisite for most roles. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and in this stack here, why I'm talking about Markdown is because I authored all of this content as Markdown. And um, I'll show you in a minute how we go about creating an article on the page. It's very simple, but it is like all written in that sort of Markdown format. So the end user sees a pretty pink thing like this, but as the, the producer of the content, you're writing in that Markdown format. Um, 
So the, w the one type of article you can make is just a, a blog post, and the other kind is a map post, and th this is probably where it gets interesting. Charlie originally made some magic, which I've then gone and like, tweaked a bit, but um, still Charlie's original brainchild here is that you can have like um, an, a kind of an article where you give it a, a web map URL um, and uh, the list of the layers that you want to see on the map, and then um, it will automatically drop in this um, web mapping component and some, you know, like th this um, table here shows you your extents and location and what have you. And it's it's open layers, this component, which is a very well respected, um, widely used web mapping um, client. Um, and you've got all this nice interactions that you can do. You can click on things and find out, find out about them and so on. Uh, and I've also done some other things like embedding the legend here, which is just done using um, like a markdown image reference to something called the the um, get legend request. Get legend request. Thank you, Charlie. It was um, going to take me a minute or two of thrashing around in my brain to, to try and remember the word. Um, and you can see some other kinds of things that you can do here. For example, I've put a code listing in here from Markdown, and you've got so, um, like the, the the platform gives you just by the fact that I used like the code listing markdown, which is done like this, you put three backticks. Um, those are called backticks, it's little um, like backwards apostrophes. If you put some code in here or something like this, when it renders, it will render it out um, in uh, with a fixed width font, with line numbers. You can configure whether you want to see the line numbers or not. And for longer listings, it will actually um, elide, which means to like shorten the 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 box to just show like the first ten lines, I think it is, and then you've got a you've got a widget which you can uh, which will pop up here to say like show me the whole box. Um, and you depending can on your theme, you can also do syntax highlighting, so you can do three back ticks, and then on the the, the top back ticks, you can specify a language. So yeah, like, like the three back ticks. Yeah, yeah, it's on the so top yes, one. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you can so you can actually specify like a language and then uh, this is kind of theme dependent though but you can you can actually specify the language to get syntax highlight in, in the yeah. code book um you'll see some other examples of like uh, i've created a hyperlink here using markdown and um i want to just show you one more example of like what you get as an end user which is uh, yeah let's go for this one here so um this one here has got this dashboard um, component embedded in it as well. Now I'm just going to grab my phone quickly, just one second. Um, so um, I've done, I don't think it was mentioned in the overview um, that I gave you of the services, but without actually explicitly including it in here, you can do a whole bunch of stuff with, um, uh, I think Mosquito is missing from the list here. Maybe Vicky, you can make a note to go and add that as well. Um, but you can do a whole bunch of um, cool workflows using your cell phone. Um, so I've got um, this, this software called OwnTracks on my system. As part of the stack as well, I will also provide instructions on how to set up a VPN, which is a virtual private network, so that my cell phone can communicate securely between um, the phone and the web server. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, actually go on my um, got my phone up here. It's not appearing on the screen recording. Sorry for those who can't see. But um, I'm going to go here and just start synchronizing. I don't know if, it, if you can see on the screen, it's flashing that little red icon there. It's busy pushing all my most recent data up to the server. And what I've prepared on this um, on this page is a report of my lo of my activities from like midnight. Um, through to you know f for the day basically so um when i f finish synchronizing it's just busy pushing data I, it will already update so i can show you here if i just reload the page um we should start to see some stuff happening here or not let's see um Live demos. <laughs> yeah, live demos always don't do what you expect. Anyway, I'll come back to it in a second. It should um, it should be showing something here. One of the um, one of the things it does as well as like um, that embedded dashboard, you can go out to the full page of the dashboard. 
I'll come check in on the page again just now. Um, just show you some other examples of where I've done like dashboard embeds here. So um, that dashboard was a widget from MetaBase, which is aggregating data from the database. Yeah. This is an example of where I've made a web map, um, which shows like from my recorded tracks, I re record the average velocity that I travel. You can see this is like a freeway, basically how I'm speeding. Here it's back in Lisbon, so it's like very congested, slow travel, slow times. This is where I live and it's all country roads and you can't drive very fast. This is another freeway. So you can build these sort of insights and things using the platform. I just did, uh, you know, SQL queries and I think I've explained all this. All the, this is an example where the code listing is very long. So, um, um, uh, this one over here will expand the whole thing out and you can see the full listing of all the SQL that I wrote. I wrote a bunch of like logic to, as the as the events come in from my phone, that it will update um, the average velocity for each, each nearest road segment based on um, all the recorded readings from my phone. Um, and this picture here shows you node red. This is the graph I made to actually do the processing. So I'll show you those again in a second. So, um, that's kind of like the user interface that you get as like the front end to this is this website with uh, blog articles and blog articles with embedded maps. And uh, you can come around, come and browse some more at the other kind of things I've published here. One of the things you can do as well, is, uh, as you probably realize, you can publish a thumbnail for every article um, and uh, kind of make it all look kind of neat. And there's some filtering options here and uh, I think you can uh, get an RSS feed and what have you from the site. So it gives you a very nice, like, polished looking landing page. Um, but how do we get content onto the site? That's the next thing to show you is this really, really nice tool called File Browser. Um, you, you'll see I've branded it with the OSGS logo again. Thanks, Charlie, for the nice logo. Um, and w with this, you can basically log into. I wouldn't want to call it like an admin backend because it basically just you're browsing a file system on um, on the server. Um, but from just simple editing of files, you can manage all the content on the server. So if I go to the top level here, you'll see that there are a bunch of different folders and directories, and they're all um, linked to the different services that are running on the server. So for example, the Hugo site, the, uh, the front end that we're looking at there, if I go and take a random article here, let's look at this article again, the Shaded Relief article. So I can actually find in the content folder here, that's a post rather than a map. So I go in there and there's a um, shadedrelief.md. Remember we said the markdown extension used, uh, uh, is given. Uh, MD is used for when you have a markdown file. Um, and if I go in here, it's got a very nice file editor. And one of my major breakthroughs <laughs> over the holidays was figuring out how to hack the CSS. So it has a really large font because I couldn't cope with the tiny font that they used. Um, and in this um, is, again, a structure that's defined by the theme. Um, and in the case of the map ones, defined by the theme and some of Charlie's like conventions that he set up for, like what, what additional things should be provided uh, for a map article. So if you think of this just like a form, you basically copy, copy one of these documents and then you just fill in the different pieces here. So I, I'll actually do that and I'll show you. Um, maybe I'll just take this So the first you. part of the text, just to explain it, is, is called the front matter, which is kind of like your metadata for that document page. So it's just, you, you can see in the file, it's like yeah. the, the this, first like three part. dashes and then the next three dashes. That, that entire chunk is just kind of these like key value metadata elements. So you can see the categories and tags. That's for like management on the front end so that the system can like, you can actually like run filters and stuff and find, for example, all of the articles tagged with GIS or whatever the case is. So um, that's where all the kind of metadata for this art, for each article or map or whatever the case is, or post uh, is stored. It's stored in that front matter. Yeah. So, so, so I can tend to be more <laughs> machine readable, though it is very human readable as well. So if I go here, I can go and uh, use this copy icon and I make a copy of that file and then I can rename it using this icon here. So it's called um, uh, Community of Practice. So I can make a new uh, file like this. As, as soon as I do this, the, um, remember I explained one of the services we have is called Hugo Watcher, this one over here. 
So we've written a bunch of logic so that whenever a file changes on the file system, it automatically publishes it on the website. So if I go here, I should actually see... Um, maybe it's smart enough to realize that it's the same thing twice. <laughs> because like, I basically I've cloned this article just with a new file name. But as soon as I start changing the titles and things, you'll see the new article gets published here. So if I go in here and I'll just start to edit things, so I can say um, um, GIS, let's say, Cartosa GIS um, Community of Practice. Okay, and we give it a publishing date. Today is number 4 of January. And we can say... Um, So the hashtag they're saying description used for search engine is because like Hugo and the theme will actually have certain, some search engine optimization uh, elements included. Basically, Hugo is a static site generator, which means that it takes these kind of flat files that you've got and then it compiles it into like an actual web page. But, you know, like it takes the markdown and then renders it as like full fledged HTML. That's what Hugo does. Um, so they call that a, a flat file generator. There's a bunch of them, you know, available. Um, Hugo is one big common one. You get other ones like Jekyll and so on. Um, but I think Hugo worked well for our purposes because it's super fast. <laughs> um, and Tim had some very nice logic for uh, that, that he set up for uh, doing that file watching, which I don't think if you had to run this on like even on, on Docker for Windows, I don't think that watcher would work, Tim. Um, just as a note. Oh, uh, it's it's got to do with the file system that uh, Windows uses. Yeah, to get note, um, uh, I I note I activity whatever what changes when I know changes. Yeah. So, um. Yeah, I've, I've 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 got a repository on GitHub called Hot Flask, which also like to to do the watcher. Um, I had to use polling, so it doesn't use the the more efficient. I mean, generally, you're going to be deploying this stack on a Linux server somewhere on a yeah. cloud hosting, or maybe in your office. But you know, I think you're going to be wanting to put it on a cloud hosting. Yeah. So while while Charlie's been chatting, I've just I made a screenshot here. Um, um, uh, Uh, this one here, um, you can see the little thumbnail preview there. So I made that screenshot just I grabbed a picture of us of a meet chat session for want of something better. Um, and uh, I've associated the screenshot with uh, as the featured image, the thumbnail and the share image. So I used the same screenshot for all three. And I'll upload that screenshot in a minute and that will be like the thumbnail that gets posted with the article. And then I can put in here some um, um, some tags, best practice maybe, and um, skill sharing, something like that. Uh, the comment is whether we want to allow comments. I haven't set up the comment thing. There's this, there's this um, platform called Discuss, which you can integrate with um, with the blog. But um, uh, yeah, it's it can get a bit. If if your if your website is popular, they start injecting ads in, into the discuss um, um, discuss you know discussion threads. So I don't really like that so much. So I'm going to keep my discussion. Free Just another note on some of those tags is that they're also um, kind of theme dependent for the most part. So things like code max lines, you know that that kind of functionality is not necessarily included in like if you use a th custom theme that's kind of why <laughs> i think it's in the best theme in the, in the first place and said there may be additional integration uh that that you would need to handle as like a web developer if you use the custom theme most of the components i think we, we've taken like kind of a minimalist approach for you know making most of the things that are available by default should be generic um, but you may stumble into issues like you know where the theme that you've chosen if it's a custom theme might not support 
like elements like uh, code blocks or you know like code max lines or something that, that, that kind of depends on the theme you choose so i'm just going to type a little bit of content here So here I might put a link to say on our YouTube channels. Can somebody dig up the YouTube channel link for me quickly? Um, and maybe I'll just go and steal out of the um, out of my diary the um, little description that I gave and can just use it as content. Um, I put it in the meeting. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so that's the, the, the invite content. Um, um, I'll just try to make it look a little bit less cut and pasted. So we're going to focus. Um, um, A whatever. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, um. Plus, it's easy to update. <laughs> What's the yeah. Um, I don't know why staff get a capital letter. Um, and there's some of my typos. Um, okay. Um, sure, lots of typos. Um, and the 10 minutes before was cut and paste out of there. So that could be maybe a bulleted list. We just put some little asterisks before that. And you can see that it does like the syntax highlighting as well for us, which is also very nice. So it colors the text according to what kind of a, what kind of content it is. Uh, Vicky, you said you put the link in the meeting chat. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I can just put the link in here. So now I've created my content for my page. Uh, I know there's no GIS involved yet, but it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. So now if I do that and save it, then go home again. Um, Have you uploaded your thumbnail? I need to upload the thumbnail as well. Um, 2201, Um Let's just close this and upload the thumbnail quickly. So the, the thumbnail goes in um, this folder called static images. And I just can press this little upload button here. Um, all right, it should be publishing straight away. Let's see. What did I do wrong? Um, let's just go back and just double check what I... Is there any... Um, Anything you can see that looks wonky here? No, I think it looks fine. Maybe it's just the watcher hasn't triggered. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go quick nerd <laughs> mode here and just go and check on the. Um, on here and see if it's actually just triggering a build. So when I save it. Um, we should see that this page, this thing updates here, showing that the build got triggered. Basically, the text is scrolling up, it got built. Um, uh, I'm not sure why it didn't um, appear on the page, but anyway, we'll go and figure that out just now. Probably some bug that I've introduced in the last day because it was working fine yesterday. <laughs> anyway, um, let's just quickly see if I go and edit this one. 
um, if it just changes that properly okay so it's something oh there we go I magically unbroke unblocked the pipe that was blocked so there's a, our new article and you uh, if everything works <laughs> <laughs> there's my text and you see I've got a little typing error there so I'm just going to see if I can fix that um, um, let's see if it updates itself okay so you can see it automatically updated when I edit it so I don't have to do anything special to publish it well, I'll find a nicer image later and you've got the thumbnail and so on so that's how you publish like um, an article so what I've been trying to do is like um, I suffer from tab overload <laughs> so I've been trying to every time I've got a tab open that like this one here is something that I've been working through or looking at. Uh, instead of keeping it as a bookmark open, I'm trying to just go and make a like a one one line or one paragraph blog article just with with the thing that I'm busy looking at and um, uh, that I can use blog articles rather than book, uh, tabs as my bookmarking. That's my goal for for this year is to try and keep my tab levels down. So. Um, so in that way, then I'm also sort of building up content for the platform. But what if we wanted to make a map? So I'm going to go on a little detour and show you some of the other parts of the file browser here. Um, because, um, you know, we, we know now how to make an article on the site. But if we want to make a map, we obviously need some GIS um, data to be uploaded and themed and all that kind of stuff first. So um, if you look through the different folders, you'll see... Um, they mainly link back to those services that I mentioned um, here. So, for example, um, Map Proxy here is um, a, a caching system so that when you make web map requests, um, if you're asking for something that's been rendered before on the server, it can just serve the pre -rendered or previously rendered um, version rather than having to ask um, a, a CPU-intensive process to happen using your JS server um, platform. So, so instead of basically extracting data from the database and styling it and producing a PNG, it just says, oh, this just fetch the PNG we made last time and, and show it to you. Um, GeoServer is that web mapping engine that I mentioned, and this, this folder allows you to upload data to publish via GeoServer. Your QGIS projects folder is um, for the QGIS server projects, so um, you can in here create a folder and put inside of there a, a QGIS project. And as long as all the data reconciles, uh, like in the context of the web server, your project will just render straight off there. Um, uh, this PG conf folder is for setting up um, your PG, your Postgres uh, authentication. I think we'll do a whole separate session on that um, and how to like basically move data in and out of your database. Um, the public folder, I don't even remember what we use for. I think it's just like a file drop place. Um, and then the theme that I'm using for Hugo is, uh, remember um, Charlie mentioned this clarity theme, Hugo clarity. So you can drop in more themes here and then uh, there's some configuration option you can set to say which theme should be used. Um, I put in this elephants one because it's like the most simple basic theme that I could find as well it's just to have another like one for reference. And then your Hugo site is your actual um, content management system uh, with all your markdown files. And then uh, your QGIS fonts is a place where you can, and that's a bit of a mess I can see already. You can upload um, fonts. Uh, Vicky, we need to fix our font downloader because it should actually be just dropping them all as like um, TTFs inside of here. Um, and the fonts that you put on, on the server, can, if they match the ones that are on your, um, on your local system when you're doing your cartography, that means that if you've got chosen some nice uh, italic pirate font or something for your, your island map and you upload the island map to the server, it can find the same font on the server. Um, Jupyter data is for um, data that you're going to use in your Jupyter notebooks. Um, QGIS SVGs are for SVG icons that you might use in your QGIS projects. Um, and Node-RED data are all the Node-RED um, like outputs that you create with Node-RED. And in the future, we'll probably add more folders and we might try to like rationalize and organize them in a more uh, like accessible way. But um, basically, the, you can think of this as like the admin backend for your site. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just make a simple QGIS project and show you a workflow for actually um, 
publishing some geospatial data. Um, see, Charlie, I remembered the clock icon this time. <laughs> was it you last time? I was moaning at me for forgetting about the clock icon. Um, um, so what I'll do is I'm just going to start off quickly by um, adding some like backdrop um, here. Let's just go and grab. Um, uh, let's put OpenStreetMap on here, and I'm just going um, to zoom into my area here. And I'm just going to like maybe digitize a polygon or something here. So uh, I'm going to say create layer, and we'll make a geo package, and we'll, we're going to go put this in our file system. So um, internally, we've got this sync thing. I don't know if, how many of you got access to this, but um, you can just ask me, and I'll add you to the sync thing. And um, I've been trying to like build up a collection of little small demo projects in here as well. So um, we just call my file basic map, something like that. And it's quite important the name that I give that should match the name of the QGIS project which we're going to create just now. So this is I'm also going to use the same name for the geo package basic map. That's going to be a geo package we create, and we're going to create a layer here called um, town. Um, I use a name so convention. That con oh, yeah. I was going to say that convention is used by the QGIS server implementation that we've set up. So um, basically, in order to be able to reference the map, you know, using like a URL, like Marvo basic map then you need to have the folder and the QGIS project name match. And it has to be stored, I think, as a QGZ, or does it? Uh, it QGZ? doesn't matter, yeah. I think it works. Uh, actually, no, I think you're right. It has to be a QGZ, yeah. QGZ, you, you're Americanizing oh, <laughs> beautiful language. Um, so, okay. The, so the I'm just, in this step, I'm just making a, a polygon layer in a geo package, and I'm just going to go digitize... Um, uh, something roughly around the edge of my valley here. Beautiful work, I must say. Um, and I will just spend a minute just also styling this because we're going to be publishing this. Or maybe I'll just un not style it first and then. Um, uh, save my edits. Show how styling can yeah. and, and saving can change. Yeah. So then uh, now I need to save my project. So I'm going to save it in that same folder. Um, and again, as Charlie was saying, now I need to take absolute care to make sure that the name of the project matches the name of the folder. So basic map. And yeah, typos can break it. <laughs> yeah. So now if I go in my um, File manager here. I'm going to go to my QGIS projects folder. Um, you'll see I've got a few different products in here. I don't really want to be sharing these two files here. I'm just going to go a little bit more into the technical details. But when you create a geo package and you open the geo package in QGIS, QGIS, well, the, the geo package, like process basically um, creates these lock files which um, basically um, uh, they're like a cache for data that's going to be moved into the data into the geo package so uh, this is the right ahead log is a stand for that and I can't remember what the SHM stands for but basically when we publish it's ideal if it's you shared can memory or something. Oh, what's that Charlie? I think it's something to do with shared memory or something. shared memory uh, maybe it's like the buffer of um, something like that, uh, I'll forget the details. So, but basically we want to try to like um, not publish with those if we can. It's probably going to work with, with them, so I'll try it with them, but just you know, you know, for you to be aware that might be a potential place where you run into issues if you um pushing those things around. So I've already got um, our QGIS projects folder here, and I've got a bunch of things in there. So I'm going to tell it I want to upload something, and that's very nice. You can tell it I want to upload a whole fo folder at once. So I'm going to go to the sync thing folder here into my QGIS projects and pick that whole folder and I'm going to upload it. It should happen very quickly because the uh, files are small. So having done that, I should now have a published web map. 
it's as easy as that. And now, how can I test that? I can go to my QGIS session, start a new project, um, go to the browser, and I can actually create a WMS connection. I'm going to assume you're all familiar with the concept of WMS. If you're not, give us a shout, and Charlie can explain while I <laughs> set up the connection. Um, So basically, the the WMS you know web map service is when we spoke about GeoServer and QGIS Server and all those sort of things. It's it's the um, process of that server technology taking your map and then rendering it as a service so that you can retrieve it from like a web service. Essentially, like when you think of like OpenStreetMap or Google Maps and so on, like you, you get all those little map tiles. Basically, we can have like a map project that QGIS serves up as. Um, a series of kind of pictures that can be re rendered in a web browser. Um, QGIS server is nice for it because you can use all of the symbology and styling that QGIS supports and then like or, like dynamically rendering it, render it that way. Uh, when it comes to other web map services, especially in open source, it's quite challenging to get effective styling to work with other map service, services. So um, th there are some standards like SLD styling, which you'll find like in, in GeoServer or GeoNode, technologies like that, um, but they have their limitations, whereas QGIS Server supports things like geometry rend uh, geometry, geometry generators and all that complex styling and uh, cartography that you, you would be very difficult to get with another uh, like server technology. That's where QGIS, QGIS Server is like really, really strong on the uh, cartography side of things. Yeah, and what you're aiming for is like what you see is what you get, like you, you design yeah. a map in on your desktop and you push it onto the server and it looks exactly the same as what your desktop map looked like. So, so what I've done here is I've set the URL for that map service to be the website and then OGC, which is the Open Geospatial Consortium, which is just the, like the convention for where um, the endpoint for that service will be. And then the actual service endpoint will be the name of the project um, that you created earlier. So it must again exactly ma match that project name. If I do that, I'll get a new connection in my connection list here. I'm going to put in um, just this tab to the side here. So if you press F12 in QGIS, you'll get this debugging tab. And it's really something you should be familiar with as well if you're doing any web service stuff because it gives you like the log of every request that gets made. And typically when you first set up these things, you might have made a typo or something. The logs provide you a way to go and diagnose wh where things went wrong. Now, I realize as I've done that, that I actually omitted a couple of steps <laughs> in the publishing. But anyway, let's see if maybe it will just work. So, so I'm going to click on here, and you can see that it's um, uh, found my map as a web service. And this is the parts that I omitted. So it's just got this untitled and then open street map layer. I wanted to actually remove that once I was um, done with my <laughs> with my preparing my project. And it's got the town layer, and the town layer you should recognize as being the one that I created. And you can see it's rendered it exactly as I made it um, in my desktop project. And you can see on this, um, on the debug development tools thing, all of the requests, even as I'm resizing the window here, it's making a new request. And you can actually go and look in the details of the request, and you can see, okay, it was asking for, for that. You recognize that project name there? That's the one that we created on the desktop. And you can see that it's asked for a bounding box. So that should be a familiar concept to you. That's like the area of, for the render. And you can see it's asked for an image um, as a PNG format. You can see it's asked for the town layer and an image of that size and so on. So you can actually get a sense of what's being asked for from the server whenever a request happens. And if I flip over to the console here, I've got the logs running off the server. And you can see again the same request now as they arrived in at the server. So they came in. There, there's some magic that the server does that like translates the project path into a, the file system path in the server. Um, and you can see, like for example, there's the bounding box that we asked for. and um, all the other pieces and like what kind of request was asked what even gives you some sense of who asked for this it was a QGIS client running version 3.2.3 3.23 actually um, um, and I was running on Fedora which is my desktop and I think I'm in KD Plasma for some reason I don't know why. Um, and uh, all the details of the request um, to the point that you could actually take the request that's been given here and copy it to uh, open it in your browser 
and you'll actually get that single image, which is something that can be handy later when you're starting to try to think of interesting ways to use these technologies to build products, because knowing how to formulate a raw image request, I could, for example, go and put this as a link in my, my page, um, in my blog article, directly, and without having a, any map widgets or browsing, whatever, I can actually just have a static picture of my map just embedded in the in the map uh, in the page and whenever the map updates that picture will update so that's kind of a handy thing to be aware of this is very useful for things like uh like things that build narratives so things like jupiter are really good for training and you know uh, processing and letting people tweak things so you can provide like a template article that just has that request and then people can change certain parameters and then they'll press run and then it'll go fetch the image and then like load it in the page kind of you know asynchronously which is like really really great as well cool so we we know that the web map is working there's some things that are not so great like the fact that it's got this layer like called untitled and it's got the open street map layer embedded in it which i didn't really want but for now i'm just going to leave it because we're going to run out of time there's a lot of things i want to show you but I, I know that this layer name is called town and that's the main thing to be aware of is the connection um the connection uh, url here and the name of the the layer so with those two pieces of information i can actually go back to my file manager here and um i can go to the hugo site again and this time we're going to make a map rather than a post so I'll go to maps here and again i'm just going to copy um uh I usually just copy the latest one that I did because <laughs> I always like improve things a little bit so whenever I um, make a copy I'll take the most improved one um, so there's my copy and I'm going to rename it I'm going to call this um, um, let's call it my file basic map just to be well, now I've broken my naming convention. But anyway, my naming convention is already inconsistent. I can see I've got three different <laughs> conventions going on there. Uh, so now it's the same deal as before, except you'll see that the front matter part, this part here, um, is a little bit different looking to the one for the, the blog article. And this is where Charlie's magic came in. Charlie, you'll see I've been extending your things as well. <laughs> um, so so now we, we basically got some fields if you think of it as a form where we can actually describe our map so i'm going to call this modifier i wonder if it's going to work with diacriticals let's see basic map. and um give it a name like this so now again it's it's wanting a thumbnail and a share image so what i usually do is i just go and um, find a picture somewhere so I, I can just save this picture uh, in my downloads and then i'll um, use that same name my var basic map.png in the um, in the picture here and I'll upload it again. Charlie will remind me when I forget just now. <laughs> um, basic map. Okay. PNG. Um, what about basic map? PNG. Okay. Now we need to, uh, we've got a few options here. So I'm going to come back to this map proxy piece just now. And we'll do it um, uh, using just a straight WMS request like this. So remember we said that the URL we have to remember from QGIS. So it's this URL over here. The hashtag t Tim was using is just commenting out those elements of front, front yeah. So when you start a, a line with a hash, it's just going to be ignored and getting processed, that's all. So I put some logic in here, Charlie, so that we can have non-tiled map requests because um, that we can avoid issues with labels being clipped or repeated or what have you. Um, this is one strategy. The other way is to use the map proxy. So I'll show you both. I'll show you maybe all three. So well, maybe, I think maybe we'll do that in another session because we run out of time. So I'll, so I'll just put it on. I'll put it on tiles. True for now. This is also uh, if you're using 
some of the o, um, open layers um, options I've linked to it here there's some option to say which server backend you're using and it does some smart things based on that um, and I also put a flag in here to say whether you want to see the OSM base map now in this case I actually do want to see the base map because I'm going to be only pulling in the town layer so here's the list of layers so again where do I get this from I just go look on this list over here and I just want this one town layer so there and then the latitude and longitude is the um, center point for the map and the zoom level bigger numbers are more zoomed in smaller numbers are more zoomed out so if I go um, to Q just here and I just right click there's this nice uh, context menu that pops up and gives you your um, coordinates for that place where you click so I can go here and I can just um, I should actually just change the template around so that it puts long first and then that but I will just remember to go like this um, I think you can. It's yeah, yeah. I, I just haven't done it. <laughs> Every time I go and <laughs> juggle these numbers around. Um, so, is that right? Um, and then the zoom level, I'll keep it like that. And then the date is just the date for the article publishing. So, that's, uh, we're not in January, February yet. We're still in January. Fourth, and then some maps, uh, some categories. Uh, this is just anything you want to put in, just as a list. Um, I'll just maybe make it as a map. Um, I haven't really gone and like planned out my categories and tags very well, but um, I'll keep those ones there. And then the summary is basically um, just that again over here. All right, and then um, if I wanted to, I could, okay, here I've also done some stuff to get the map legend. So I can actually find out, this is a case where I've used that same trick that I showed you before about knowing the URL for um, something that comes back from the service. So if I go look in queue just here, one of these requests will be for a get legend request. I just first want to show you the layer list. You see it's generated a legend here, and this is actually a picture it gets pulled from the server. So if I go look amongst these requests here, one of them will be uh, get legend. What's it called again? Um, that's capability. Uh, get legend request. Um, ah, let me collapse it. I think you probably want to extend that debug window here yeah, so you can actually yeah. see what. I needed to wrap because um, and, uh, let's just make that all there and then I can maybe go wider. Um, okay, so I'm looking for this one here. It's get legend graphic. Yeah, so knowing that, I can just copy that um, URL. And if I go look in the browser, same way I did here, I can see that just gives me back the legend for the map. So I, I can pr probably automate this later. I just haven't got around to it. But, um, so if I want to get the legend, I just stick that whole URL into here. And I'll say, um, hey, um, something like that, I don't know. Um, this is the markdown syntax for putting an image. It looks like a link, but you put this exclamation mark in the front, and you can also put the uh, uh, accessibility caption in over there. I'm going to strip out this other stuff. We don't need it right now. Um, and that should be enough for us to have made a map. If all goes well, if I press save, we will see a new map appearing in the, um, on the page here. Okay, there's our new page. There's my map of Marval. I can zoom and pan on it, click on it. There's my query results for when I click on it. Um, and there's my legend. So, uh, pretty easy actually. I mean, it's not 100% point and click, but it's, it's for, uh, for now it's as, it's as easy as we can make it. And with all the luxuries of having everything just done for you as, like, um, as automatically on the back end as you can. Is everybody still following or will put you all to sleep? <laughs> I just do a little 
check in around the room to see if you follow me well, Yasha. I'm asleep, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm still with you. I just want to make my bird nap using this of our whole area. <laughs> cool. In fact, what we can actually do, um, I haven't really set it up for multi-user blogging, but I think we can mm. figure out something. We can actually just put an extra tag in there to say who the blogger is, and I can give you all access to this instance, and you can have at it, and it'll be great. Just treat it like a production instance, so anything you put on there, just make sure it's like kind of works and looks neat and tidy. Um, I think ultimately we can like syndicate the blog articles from here into the main Cartosa blog as well. Uh, like avoid having two different systems that don't mm. like um, have any interlinking between them. Um, so let's go quickly just show you how we might change the styling for that. So there are a couple of things which upset me, um, like the fact that I wrote town here in the legend of the small t. Everyone knows that I'm a bit of a pain pain in the ass when it comes to all those kind of things. So let's go and like unupset myself here. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna rewind some of all these little user interface changes I made because I don't really need to see um, the debugging so much. I've got the bits of information out of it that I wanted. Um, I think I can certainly automate the legend and some of that stuff later. Um, just it's not happened yet. Um, so that's the layer list, the browser. Let's drop over the site. Um, this is opening the web service. This isn't the project. Yeah, and I'm just first getting my user interface okay. back like I had it. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, and then uh, so so I can I don't need to save this as a project because all I did was basically just drop that one web service layer in just to validate. And I ho I hope it's clear for you all that this is queue just like rendering a picture from the web service. It's not like my local data. Um, did we lose the Asha along the way? Are you still? Oh no, she's still there. Okay, she, her icon disappeared in my browser. Um, okay, so now I'm going to go back and open the re the previous project, and I want to make some changes to it because I don't like the cartography. I'm going to go here and maybe um, make it n not have a full, which you can do in a hundred different ways. I can just use the outline, uh, simple line, for example, like that. Maybe. Um, we can do, I don't know, we can put some, let's try to make something a little bit challenging for the, um, to show like the, basically the the point that you can make cartography that um, it would be hard to do in GeoServer, for example. Uh, let's do interpolate. Like a centroid. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you can do centroid, yeah, but you know, it's all a pain in the ass to do with SLD, but um, where is that nice? Uh, one that does strokes along the line, hashed line. That's the one. Yeah. And let's take away the um, pull there. And I don't know. The, there's some weird stuff going on there. I don't know how to fix that, but um, it's because the endpoint. Um, oh, cool. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. Anyway, I'll just leave it like that. <laughs> It's no thing of beauty, but that's Niall's it. been adding like to the latest versions of Q just some quite advanced, like you know, uh, mm. along the edge of lines and staying. Yeah. Uh, they still, I guess, I need to have like a, um, some. I don't know. Yeah, I need to play with it some more just because that that would bother me. Um, anyway, yeah, we'll just leave it like that. Okay, and then. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tidy up some of these things here. So I'm going to rename the layer to town. I don't actually want to see this one. Um, now, remember when I um, uh, created the web page, I called it town with a small t. So that might be um, giving us a problem later. And what I, I usually do is I make a group, um, you know, let's call it um, my file, for example. And I put all the things that I want to go like together in my web map so that I can just put one layer basically, because um, this is considered by WMS as a layer, and so is this. Um, and then on this group, you've got this WMS data um, properties that you can say um, my file, okay, and then you can say um, 
simple net of mark the right and you could put any more details that you want in there so that that thing was specifically for the fact that i'm publishing um, as wms um, and i can also go in the layer properties here and i don't know if you noticed when i did the get feature info i got a lot of messy stuff here i got feature uh, feature one feature id one and what have you so i want to tidy that up a bit so i can go to the fields here and you'll see that um, You've got options here whether to expose them via WFS, WMS, and so on. So by doing that, I um, told it like basically don't show me that FID if I click on it on the feature. And for this name, I'm going to give it an alias of name because I like my things to start with a capital letter. So um, uh, why is it not letting me go in there? Um, Are you in edit mode? You're not in edit mode. Um, double click. I'm there. double clicking furiously. Let me just see. Um, oh, I think it comes from here. Wait, sorry. It's a bit confusing there. I thought you used to be able to edit it both here and there. I thought you could edit it mm. there. I mean, if you update it, if you just if apply, I, if, I, other if I open and close again, it should be. Uh, it yeah, might so be your bleeding edge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I've got a nice looking name for the name column and I've hidden the other one. I could also go in here and add more metadata if I wanted to. Um, oh, sorry, in this one. No, it's a bit this confusing. Isn't a, it, isn't ultimately, a, these two things need to be merged, but at the moment they're still separate. Um, um, this is in the layer properties, though. This is not the project properties, which you can also configure. Yeah. Lots and lots of options because it's uh, non-trivial technology, I guess. So you can fill in all these keywords, and you've got yeah, you know, like uh, Charles says, this, you can say, for example, uses different URL for the legend, um, uh, and you can say um, like who who is the owner of the data, what have you. If I go into project properties here. Oh crap, I didn't save my work. And it's really crashed. Project properties has been crashing <laughs> um, frequently for me. I'm just going to do an updated build. Okay, so I'm gonna speed speed redo that. Sorry, I should have pressed uh, save as I was working. Um it's like crashed so hard it won't even give me my console back. do that the speed version of those same things again with a few saves in the middle <laughs> where's my new one okay. all right how can we do that high speed let's go so uh, make a new group um, I'm not going to try and show the project properties because I know it's going to crash again if I go in there. Um, uh, I'm going to go to the fields here. We're going to tell this one to not expose by WFS. We're going to go here. We're going to go there. Change that to name. Um, we're going to rename the layer here. To town boundary. Let's call it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, save my work let's give it some styling quickly this is nice you get to see uh, if you miss something you get to see it all again so we'll look on the bright side of the problem there we go simple line uh, just clone that once and go make this one uh, hashed line like that something yeah um, I was just wondering if we 
Oh, that's nice. Um, I wanted to do it the other way, like that. Cool. Uh, save my work again. Okay, and then um, I just wanted to set the WMS properties here. So this one is cool. My bar and um, all right and then uh, I can publish that again by doing the same workflow here so I can go back to my thing magic here um, I know in advance already that the layer name has changed right so I'm just gonna go and change that to Marval I don't think anything else needs to get changed in there, so I can leave it like that. That's a nice way that Tim's showing to do it there with the group, because then you can have multiple layers and they'll all just be kind of rendered as like a single map. Or yeah, something. I don't have to go and like explicitly list all the layer names that I want in my net. Um, but the nice thing is it does give you control, so you can actually access individual specific mm, layers. Yeah, the choice is all yours to make how you want to do it. Um, oh, am I going here? Um, did I upload my Marval map? No, I don't think you did. Uh, let me do that. You're supposed to remind me, Charlie. I was waiting for, <laughs> for, for, for uh, us to get to the point where it was a problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to go back to my QGIS project folder. Uh, QGIS projects, Marval based map. Now, I just want to upload... Um, I'm going to actually just delete these two files because they do irritate me. Um, I'm going to just upload the changed project files. So I'm just going to go in here and go. Um, um, I'm just going to grab that one file because I didn't change anything in the data. All right, and that should be enough for us to. Um, be getting a different looking legend here we go and test okay so that failed because the layer name changed remember so here in the url it was saying town before now let me just say my file uh, and something's still wrong so i, I always like to just go and uh, connect to that service again in QGIS and just see if it's showing me what i think it is so there's my basic map Okay, so it's still got the old data, some really added refresh capability. So something's broken. Um, um, okay, that that file is corrupt for some reason. Um, so let me try to upload it again. Uh, Now how you know that, you basically have to look at the logs or just try like uploading it twice. Let's see if it works now. Getting the same error. Maybe it resaves the project. Ah, uh, because just... I deleted those wells. Oh my god, it's my fault. Okay. Um, wait, let's go and upload them. They do irritate me, but they were also being used by QGIS. So sorry, QGIS. Um, is your project open though? Because those should only be open while the geo package is being read. Yeah, so what I can do is I can it just go here and open. just, uh, my project is closed now. But actually, you need to close QGIS for the handle to be relinquished, I think. Uh, let's just upload the whole set again. Um, Package again. Okay, woohoo, there's my, my legend. It's still something a bit irritating there because the you get this like double thing, but uh, I'm not going to try to fix that now. And if I go refresh my page, um, you can see my cartography is there exactly as I um, created in QGIS. And this would have been doing this simple thing in GeoServer with SLD. Good luck to you to do that in a 10-minute demo. <laughs> I think it would be, I'd be here all morning trying to 
get it to do something like that. So, um, cool. I hope you get a sense of like the QGIS map publishing workflow. I'm going to show you just a few other things quickly. I'm going to just blow out the last 23 minutes unless you want to have some, maybe uh, I'll go for another 13 minutes. Then we've got 10 minutes just to plan our next session. Okay. So, um, anything you want to ask me about what I've shown you with the QGIS publishing workflow? No, it looks pretty good. Stunned silence. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to show you like um, that we've also got GeoServer um, uh, available on the stack. And um, I need to find the password quickly. Um, so I think, Amy, you've already played with GeoServer and some of your work played, played with, worked with um, um, for the interns. It's like basically another a uh, very powerful, very good piece of software for publishing web maps, but uses a totally different like um, approach to the, to what I've just been showing you with the workflow with QGIS. So I would say, like, when would I use GeoServer rather than QGIS server? Um, that's a good question, Charlie. What would your answer <laughs> for that be? Maybe when you less concerned about how things look and more concerned about having them published in a whole bunch of different formats. I don't know. Um, no, I'm I'm more of the opinion that like so th there's different ways to handle data access and permissions management. Uh, you know, on, on like granular control level and yeah, so on. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. Things like uh, like uh, you know database permissions are, are so like you're using Post Postgres essentially. So like if you're like a really skilled database administrator, like just handle all the permissions in the database, then you can use whatever you want. But if you want to abstract that. Uh, GeoServer is very good, and GeoServer coupled with GeoNode is like really, really good because then, you know, you, you can have like someone who's just got some basic web administration experience, uh, you know, managing complex permissions without having to like do a lot of heavy lifting like yeah. in the database or something. But so, getting so for example, you could do granular things like um, with our with our Marvel map example you could say like this user can see this polygon this one can see that polygon this one can see all the polygons like to get that kind of granular stuff you, you can actually do it with QGIS server as well but it's a lot more hip, hip jumping than um, doing it using um, GeoServer I think and you've got a whole framework for authentication different authentication backends and having users and groups and roles and so on also, imagery or, or raster data can be quite efficiently served with GeoServer. Again, like QGIS can do some very nice, uh, like rendering or like get you the, the symbology in QGIS can can be done very nice. And then uh, you can serve it up as like a, a web service from there. But management of raster data stores in GeoServer is quite nice. You can also do things like geofencing, I think, or whatever they call it. But mm. <laughs> I think it's geofences. Uh, you know, so, there's so a whole bunch the, of plugins the, as well. That there's get, functionality, be there's plugins, yeah. Um, I think the, like, the, it also depends on what resources you have available. So if you have an organization that has, like, a, a large catalog of, like, print templates that work with, like, Mapfish or something, you want to implement GeoServer. Whereas if you're starting from scratch, you know, you can use QGIS templates or, or the layout manager and use get print requests from QGIS server. So it's kind of your choice depending on what resources you have available but it is nice to have uh, the both of them mm. yeah, yeah. I definitely do use both although it's like hard for me to always articulate wh when why I choose one over the other but um, uh, um, yeah and it's and I think as a GIS practitioner knowing both is very important in your skill set because sometimes the client's problem needs GIS server to be used and you need to be aware of how it works so um, let's show you how to publish some data quickly and I'll, I'll try the simplest um, um, approach here. I'm going to make a new data store. Um, uh, I'm actually just going to make a new workspace first just to show you the hierarchy. So it's got like this hierarchical um, data structure. So workspace would be, um, let's make one called my val. Um, um, it's like it's like think of it like a project folder or a place where you can like um, group a bunch of different services and then within the workspace like I can create. Mm -hmm. 
or like a schema workspace. A schema, yeah. like a schema. So now I can make a new store which is associated with that. And for this one, I'll maybe just uh, use that same geo package. So I want to. I want to put that same geo package. It's going to be a bit of data duplication, but I'm going to put that same geo package uh, into this folder now. Not the QGIS project file because um, geo server doesn't know what to do with the QGIS project file, but I can take that same geo package and just drop it in here. Uh, there it is there. And then because I've put it in this geo server user data folder, I can come along here and um, I'm just going to call it my file. description in here I'm going to go and work my way in the file system which is up at the root of the file system you'll see there's the same folder name GeoServer user data and there's my my geo package um, uh, and that should be enough and you can see that it's found that one layer called town yeah it's because it doesn't know the key just then the name that I use in QGIS. so I can publish that layer now I can go and say, I want to give it a capital T, for example. Uh, actually, I'll keep that one and use that one as a capital T. And uh, then you got to do the most basic things just to tell it what the bounds are. You can click on these two links and it calculates the bound, bounding box for your layer. You can add other metadata and other stuff in here. You should actually do that. Um, and here is some options to tell it which... Um, feature type details, you'll notice that that FID doesn't appear here, so I don't have to do my magic to get that to disappear. So now I've published this um, layer called town, and I actually don't like the name town, I'm going to call it my file here. Give it something but basically, it. like, GeoServer gives you, like, a lot of control over these properties. So, for example, if you have a worldwide data set, I think QGIS gives you the bounding areas as well you can define for a layer. But, mm. like, you, know, you can have, like, a, a data collection that has, you know, you know, world access, but when you publish it as a service, you just want to show a particular region and so on. So, like, all of these controls, like, seem extraneous or whatever, but, like, they're there for a reason. You know, no one yeah. went and developed all this functionality for nothing. <laughs> So I, I, I um, yeah. So I went then to look at the layer preview, and you can see that I get a again an open layers map, and um, there's that same object, and you see it's published as a WMS service. In fact, if I wanted to, I could go here, take this URL, and um, again go to QGIS, which is again has it died a sad death again. <laughs> I must get my build updated a bit um, and now I could add another WMS link but this time to um, to be like OSGS geo server Marva simple map uh, put the URL of that um, I don't think I need to put that in there uh, in there and then there's my new one um, and you can see all the layers that were in my list here. One, two, three layers there are appearing here. And if I get to take the Marvel well time boundary and drop it in here. Then uh, I get this rather nasty looking grey <laughs> cartography um, render of, um, of my same layer. And again, I could do the same exact workflow as before by getting the... Um, you know the legend URL and making a, publishing it as a web map in uh, in our uh, in the web front end, um, but but I could also because it's GeoServer, server what what's really nice is that that layer will also be published automatically I think as uh, WFS. So one of the workflows I would typically do if I want to style that is I go to where's my WF, ah, there we go. Uh, so let's make a new connection here. I'm going to call it OSGS Geo Server Val Simple Map. And the URL is going to be now we're going to change this to WFS, the Web Feature Service, which basically is going to send vector geometry objects backwards and forwards instead of pictures of them. 
Okay, let's see if that works. Okay, now I can see the same three layers. If I add that layer back in the map again, what I'm going to get is something that's rendered with a random color by QGIS, and um, it's actually an editable thing. I can, uh, you can, with WFS is actually the protocol that allows you to like send your edits back to the server as well, which is a kind of nice thing. You can actually serve WFS with QGIS server as well, so it's not only GeoServer that can do that. But what's interesting now is I can come here and style this. Um, I don't think it will manage that same style. Should we, should we see if it will cope trying to do the same style? Let's do, let's, let's do that then as, a, as like a sales and marketing pitch for why you want to use QGIS server for your cartography. Um, clone that. And we're going to put that one to hashed line. Um, Something like that, yeah. Um, so if I if I wanted to, I can take this layer um, style properties over here, and I can say save style, and I can choose here SLD, which is this web mapping styling format, and I'm just going to save that as mobile SLD. layer descriptor or something. Yeah. Um, and then I can say, okay, now what I've done is created a, a file on my disk here with um, an XML document inside of it. And you'll see there, <laughs> let's see, yeah, it basically said, uh, couldn't do that hash line. We don't know what to do with it. So we're going we're gonna to get just basically the outline of our map without the internal line. So if I go back to the geo server here, there's a styles manager here. I can create a new style. I'm going to call this um, mobile town T1. Ah, made the same type of twice. That's funny. Um, and in the workspace, I'm going to say it's part of my mobile workspace. I'm using SLD. There's other formats you can use as well, like um, uh, Carto CSS. Um, it's funny that it doesn't show there. Anyway. I always use SLD, so and I put it in there. I can validate I don't know if that. That's an extension. Is it the CSS? I'm not, sure. um, I'm not sure. Too. Uh, I put it in there. I can I can see some basic stuff like there's the legend item name. There's the stroke color. Um, if I wanted to change that color to red or something, I could come along later. I can save that, and I can actually. Um, uh, in that same cartography thing, I can go to the publishing here and say I want to use that as the default for my uh, town layer here. And I don't know what the associated does, I can't remember. Um, and then I can actually get a preview and just apply that. Doesn't the associated like link it with the capabilities of the layer or something? Could be. I don't know if it's having a wobble now. Uh, it's busy. It's bu busy wobbling. But certainly not as easy as just yeah. <laughs> copying a QGIS just project. <laughs> Especially yeah. when you're when you've got complex cartography and uh, you're having to f tweak and fiddle with these XML files. Editing a few markdown files here is, uh, I think, it's fine and accessible. But when you start having to delve into SLV for doing cartography is not very <laughs> accessible. I think it's hanging. Um, let's just try to refresh in QGIS and see if it, if, if it's worked, then this style should have updated according to the SLD. So you can see it's now drawing it with the thing. It does some funny clipping thing. I think the clip boundary maybe was just a bit too tight on the, on the edge of the polygon and it's actually clipping the, the line. Edge of the line. Off, off it. Um, yeah, so that's maybe where I'll stop today and hopefully you've got a sense of it. There's a lot more that we'll show you even on the high level tour of all these other different services. Um, um, and um, Vicky has been tasked with writing up all these different workflows. So hopefully you've got some material <laughs> that you can come and grab out of, out of this recording, Vicky, um, to help you write up some more workflows. But um, Get other people to contribute to. If there's something they don't understand, then they 
can expand on. Yeah, or maybe we can even ask you interns to help write up some workflows yourselves as well. But I think it needs a bit of R and D first to kind of like figure out how to articulate it, and then uh, uh, make we can a short get code for get legends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we can get the interns to follow the workflows after Vicky's done them and go test them and see if they actually work for you and if there's any corrections or improvements to make. And, um, yeah. Cool. Um, so I'll stop the recording there and, um, and then we can switch over to questions. So thank you all who've been watching our very long <laughs> recorded session. I hope you got some value out of that and um, we'll catch you for the next one.